Okay, folks, this is part three of our uh, series with Warren Mosler discussing the seven deadly innocent frauds. We are presently on deadly fraud number four, dealing with Social Security. And I'm going to let Warren start with that one. If you don't mind, all over again. Okay. All right. So, so you know, the whole idea, I guess there's a lead in um, in the book. If you want to read the lead in uh, the heading for that chapter, do you have it there? I'm sorry? Do you have the heading for that chapter there? I the have ju- what the, the heading of the chapter said was Social Security is broken. Right. right. Okay, there you go. All right. So it's commonly believed, it's universally agreed that Social Security is broken. It's not just. Uh, you know, the, the right, it's the left as well. The headline left says it's, you know, unsustainable. We've got to do something about it, either reduce the benefits somehow or increase time, you know, or else it's unsustainable. Okay, so, and the idea is that the government is running out of money. The trust fund is going to be bankrupt at some point in time, and you won't be able to get your payment. So they're trying to save Social Security so that you can get your payment. Well, how do you get your payment? And so you can actually watch it today on your computer screen. You look on your screen and you have $2,000 in your account and you're waiting for your $3,000 Social Security payment. And you watch and you watch and you watch and all of a sudden, blah, blah, you've got $5,000 in your account. Okay, well, what did the government do? All they did was change the two into a five. You went from 2000 to 5000 You had two zero zero zero. Now you have five zero zero zero. They just changed the number. Okay, they did. It wasn't somebody that hammered some gold coin into your computer or cash and somehow stuck it in some machine and paid you, or they took somebody else's tax money and gave it to you. All they did was change your number up. And, then, and so, like, you can't run out of that. Uh, and the example I use is the football stadium, where if you kick a field goal and you get three points and you see three points go up on the scoreboard. Where, uh, where does points come from? Like, well, they don't come from anywhere. In the stadium just posts the points. They change the number on the scoreboard. They light up some little light bulbs that looks like what we would call a three, and we all know that information means three points. It's not something that comes from anywhere. And we don't go running around saying, look, we've got to limit the amount of points our kids can score in football when they play football because we're going to run out of points someday and they won't be able to play anymore. I mean, the government can't run out of money. They can't run out of dollars to pay you because all they're doing is changing a number to a higher number. That's what payment is. And, and that higher number is good funds, good money. You can go out and spend it. Now, when they tax, it's the same kind of thing. Okay, so I have $5,000 in my account and I pay a tax of 2000 Like, what happens? Well, uh, <laughs> the five turns into a three. Okay, and so now... I said, so what did the government do? Well, they changed my the number down to a lower number. So the guy at the IRS who collects taxes, he's changing numbers down. The guy at the Treasury spending, he's changing your numbers up. Okay, that's all they're doing. They don't even have each other's phone number. When they go to change your number up, he doesn't say, well, wait a minute. i got to make sure this guy changed your number down. They don't even know each other. They're independent operations. Right? And so, number one, it can't be... Yes, Congress can vote to not make your payment, but they can't not have the ability to pay. They might not have the willingness to pay. They don't want to pay you for some reason. They don't like the way you look or something. They hate old people, but they, they can't. Or they just got it wrong and they think they're running out of money or something. They can't. They always have the ability to simply change the number in your account. And that's how all payment is made. This is not a distinction. It's not like, well, there's printing money and then they're spending this. And that. It's all the same. They just change numbers up. Okay? Taxing is all the same. It's just changing numbers down. There's nothing else they can do. And the difference is the surplus or deficit. Now, when they look at the Social Security Trust Fund, what's that? That's nothing more than the accounting record of what they've already done. And what does accounting mean? Something. It's after the fact record keeping. Okay, so when they change your number down because you made a Social Security tax payment, you paid FICA taxes, they change your number down, they write that number, they enter that number into the Social Security trust fund. They keep track of it. 
we change this number down 2,000, we say we put 2,000 in this fund. Okay. Then when they make a payment to, of 1,000, they change the trust fund to a, a lower number, to 1,000. And then now the accountants can come in and make sure everything's in balance. We tax this much, we spent this much. Here's the difference that matches up with the number in the trust fund. So now the accounts balance, we can all go home for the night. So the trust fund is a record of what they've done. And right now there's a big surplus in social security, which means they've changed their numbers down a lot more than they've changed them up. They've changed down, I don't know how many trillion more than they've, maybe three or 4 trillion more than they've changed up. And that number is in the trust fund. Well, they say over time that's going to change. You know, when they make payments, they'll be changing the numbers down faster than they're changing the numbers up. And that Social Security trust fund is going to go to zero. Well, then what happens? Is some bell ring? <laughs> no, it's just keeping track of what they've done. Okay. Once it, what if it goes negative? Does somebody get an electric shock? No. It just says, okay, we change more numbers up than we change down, but now it's a negative number. It's not any kind of a operational limit. It might be a self-imposed limit by Congress who says if that number ever goes there, we're going to do this. Okay, but that's a political decision. This is not a financial restriction or restriction of the operations of the monetary system. It's complete nonsense. Okay. Yeah. I got to interrupt. So we hear a lot of the Democrats in particular talking about how the Republicans raided. Yeah. I mean, like went in there with a bunch of numbers in their fingers yeah. and raided the Social Security Trust Fund. Yeah. How much of a liar are they? I mean, really, honest to God, what kind of I mean, this is worse than telling. I, I can't I cannot think of a worse lie that Democrats have told in my entire life. That may be the worst one. I mean, I'm sure there are others, but that one really sticks with me big time. Yeah, no, it's, it's completely nonsensical. It does. It has no grounding in reality. There is. It's completely inapplicable to anything I've ever anybody can imagine in the monetary system that we have. It just it just has no existence whatsoever. It has no operational existence whatsoever. When they spend, they change numbers up. When they tax, they change numbers down, and then they keep track of what they did. It's not. It's not like it's some stock of things that you money comes in or out of or anything like that. It's after the fact, the record keeping. It's not the money. It's an account of how other bank accounts will change. So you can keep track of it. You write things down to keep track of it. You know, it's like when you have a checking account and you, you balance your checking account. You're not changing money around when you're balancing it. You're just writing down the checks and subtracting and looking to see how much you have left. You know, that's not the money. It's just a record of what you've done. So now I think i to add something here, if I have a minute, about Steve Moore. Yes. So I've got the story of Steve Moore in the book, and it's about privatizing Social Security. And he's still on that. Now he's one of Trump's senior transition economic advisors. And he's entirely intellectually dishonest on this, because he was at my conference in Singer Island, Florida, and we went through it, and he agreed I was right. And it's in the book, the whole story. And it comes down to this. When you privatize Social Security, what, what are they actually talking about? You say, well, look. You can invest your money better than the government. So instead of giving your hundred dollars to the government for social security payment, instead you buy stock. And we're gonna limit it to safe stock so you can only buy the S P five hundred or something. And, and that way it'll compound more money at the end. And this is gonna be a benefit. So what I do is I look at it, okay. You know, that might be true for one individual, but let's look at the whole economy see what it actually does, if it does anything at all. And then one individual is worse off. So if you look at the economy as a whole first, then you can see, then you can go back and say, yeah, well, Joe's going to be helping. It needs to be hurt, right? So, um, so what we have, we pay, you okay? Yeah. So when we pay your $100 into Social Security, what are you doing? You're giving the government $100 now, and you're getting back a hundred dollars. You're getting back money from the government later after you retire. You're getting it back later. Does that sound familiar? Yes, that's what a treasury bond is. You give the government money now, and you get it back later. That's what a savings account is. You give the bank money now, and you get it back later. So social security payments that, that you pay in are nothing more than, than the purchase of a government bond. Now you might argue that the interest rate is too low. The benefits amount to a 2% rate and you might get five somewhere else. And that's fine because Congress decides the benefits. 
if they want you to get a higher benefit, they can pay a higher benefit. Okay, so let's not argue about the interest rates, but what it is, is when you put money in Social Security, you're buying a government bond. Okay. What about when you do it? Okay, well, under this privatization, when you buy stock, you're buying it in the market, which means somebody else is selling you the stock. So the only thing that's happening is you buy your $100 worth of stock from somebody else, and the hundred dollars changes hands. You used to have it instead of giving it to the government to buy a bond, you give it to somebody else and you own the stock. So now you have the stock and the other guy has the bond. I mean it has the dollars, a hundred dollars. Well then then when they do this privatization thing, now the government goes out and sells a hundred dollars worth of bonds, okay, to pay for it, so to speak. The guy with the hundred dollars buys the government and bond. Somebody buys it. Let's just say it's only two of you in the economy. Okay. That guy with the hundred dollars buys the government bond. Okay, so let's go back and trace this back to, to explain what I just said. The way it works today is you take your hundred dollars and you buy, uh, you give it to the government as a social security payment. And what you're really doing is buying a government bond. So you own the bond and some other guy owns the stock. That's our. That's how it works today. If it gets privatized, okay, you take your hundred dollars and buy the stock from the other guy. So now you own the stock. He takes $100 and buys a bond from the government, who sells a government bond, so he owns a bond instead of you. So privatizing Social Security does absolutely nothing more than shift stocks from one person to another and shift bonds from one person to another. It doesn't change one penny of anything in the macro economy. When I said this to Steve, he goes, yeah, yeah, you're right. He said, we didn't say it's gonna help investment or anything else. I said, well, then like, what are you doing? It's just a balloon He says, well, it's privatization, and I'm in favor of privatization, so I support it. All right, well, that's just a play on words. It's just semantics. Okay, he knows it's like doesn't do anything, but they're supporting this silly thing under the guise of privatization. Well, there's privatize. You know, I guess under some narrow definition of privatizing, but if you look at the macro economy, nothing's. It's just shifting things between people, and it's called the, the nobody. You know, both people together don't earn any more money. You know, one guy's got the same bonds, another guy's got the same stocks. Who's going to win? I don't know. Nobody knows. Uh, presumably, stocks are fair value and bonds are fair value, so it should be a trade. You know, it should be maybe the government's underpaying you Social Security. They should be paying more. Fine, go out and promote higher Social Security payments. You know, that's a whole different issue. So I just want to bring that up about what's going on. It's a deadly innocent fraud. It's still there in capital letters. President Obama had a proposal to save Social Security, to um, reduce benefits by extending the age that you collect or something. It's complete nonsense. Now, there's one more thing that's developed, if I can add this here, and that is, I want to talk about the burden of proof that Social Security is a problem. Okay, how do you know Social Security is a long-term problem? Okay, how do you know there's a long-term deficit problem? Big problem. We know that because the government's just changing numbers. Okay, it could create inflation. If someday all these social security payments that you're making get so large that we run out of goods and services for sale and there's too much spending and unemployment's down to 3% wages, you're creating inflation. Okay, so there is a potential inflation problem, but there's no solvency problem. We're not going to go broke or anything like that, but the inflation rate could go up. So it seems to me the burden of proof on someone who wants to cut Social Security, cut Medicare, cut entitlements, even if they're going to be in a zillion dollars, the burden of proof is on him to show that they're going to create an inflation problem, or else all that spending is easily being you know, absorbed by the economy. It's, there's, there's plenty of goods and services for sale to cover it, unless there's an inflation problem. Okay, so let's look at the inflation forecast. Well, the Fed's 30-year inflation forecast is 2%. The CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, another conservative institution, their um, inflation, long-term inflation forecast is 2%. How about the precious free market treasury tip security you know, inflation index bonds? I haven't looked recently. They're like one and three quarters or something like that. Also very low, well, right? Anybody who claims that we have an entitlement problem is claiming that these payments are so high that there's going to be an inflation problem because that's the only possible problem. And so the burden of proof is on him 
to show at least me that these forecasts by the Fed, the CBO, and the free market are wrong. And maybe they are. They could be wrong. So let me see your math that the, if we don't do something about entitlements, the inflation is going to go to 20% or 10%. Then show that number to Congress that in 20 or 30 years, inflation is going to go up to 10% if you don't do something. So you got to act now and let them, because those are the real facts. And that's what, that's, that's the reality that they should be voting on. Not the idea that we're going to run out of money and if China cuts us off from borrowing, we're not going to be able to make these payments. It's not that kind of a situation. Okay? Sure. Well, the headline, the headline left, okay, Paul Krugman and Rise were the headline left progressive, where if they had it right, you wouldn't be here, of course. So obviously they don't. Or should I say they do have it right? <laughs> but <laughs> forgive the fun. But uh, they all concede there's a long term deficit problem. Short term, we need a higher deficit, but long term, it's going to be 117 trillion. It's a huge number. We got to do something. They're conceding, and rather than, you know, when the burden of proof is on the other side, they don't even make that other side go there. They've got the argument one that there isn't an entitlement program by saying, by pointing out that, look, the only problem you guys point to is a potential inflation, and look at these forecasts. Show me the wrong. They don't do that. They just concede it. Both sides agree, and now it's almost inevitable. There's going to be, you know, a that's a shame. That's a damn shame. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think we're at my favorite one, which is number five, which is the trade deficit is an unsustainable imbalance that takes away yeah. jobs and output. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, that was the whole election or a lot of the election. Right? So. Where is the best place to start? Let's look at what the real wealth of any area is, let's say the United States. Okay, so the real wealth are all the goods and services we produce domestically. Now let's call it our pile of stuff. Okay, and so your real wealth is your pile of stuff. So we produce this big pile of stuff with domestic production. And of course, the more people you have working, the more stuff you real wealth you have and services are what's real wealth. Okay. That. all your imports, everything you bring in makes that pile higher. That adds to your real wealth. Okay, Minus all your exports. Everything you send away to somebody else makes your pile smaller. Okay, So everything you produce plus what everybody else gives you minus what you have to give them. Okay, And what they give you minus what you give them used to be called real terms of trade. You're taking things in, you're giving things out. You want to like make your pile as large as possible, not as small as possible. I mean, these people are talking about exports are so good and we need to have more exports and uh, all these export powerhouses. Well, let's take it to the extreme. Suppose we exported everything we produced and didn't keep anything for consumption, domestic consumption. What would happen? We didn't import anything, we just exported everything. Well, if exports are good, that's the absolute best case. Well, everybody dies. You have no food, you have no energy, you have nothing, right? You've exported everything that you produce. You just die. Okay. So obviously uh, there's some problem here with this idea that exports are some kind of benefit. They're not. They're the cost. The things you give away are a cost. Things you get are a benefit, right? And so if you imported everything and were able to do it indefinitely and didn't produce anything, you could be playing golf and tennis and swimming and boating and people just sending you all the stuff. You don't have to work for it. You're not going to die if you have too many imports. You're, you're drowning in prosperity. Okay, so the way I say it in the book and say this, imports are real benefits and exports are real costs. So what's the problem? Okay, the problem is when we import, okay, and we buy the imports, then people don't have enough money left to buy the domestic output. Okay, and so people lose their sales go down, people lose their jobs, and that's suddenly the imports have created unemployment. So the problem now is not the imports, it's the policy response. The policy response to more imports can be something like, well, let's eliminate the FICA taxes, let's eliminate the Social Security and Medicare taxes. Okay. Now the average family has an dollars a month to spend because the government's not taking it away from them. And now they have enough all the imports, 
plus everything we can produce at full employment domestically. And then we have the best of all worlds, and then you import your true benefits because we have full domestic production plus all the imports as our supporting our real standard of living. Now we had this in 1999. Okay, it was done through the private sector debt, which wasn't sustainable, but we had the prosperity. Why did we have that? We had the largest trade deficit ever. It was almost four hundred billion dollars back when that was huge money. Okay? And unemployment was under four percent. How is that possible? It's because Americans had enough spending money to buy everything we could produce domestically at full employment, plus everything the foreigners wanted to sell us. Okay, and on a net basis. And that okay, now we didn't sustain it. Once the private sector credit collapsed, you know, in the year 2000, after Y2K, after a lot of different things happened, instead of making a fiscal adjustment where we would lower taxes or increase public spending to support domestic demand, we just let everybody lose their jobs. And then we blame foreign trade. Okay, and so, you know, it's a little bit like if you're driving a car down the road, everybody knows you've got to have your hands on the steering wheel. It's not going to go straight down the road. It's going to move a little bit to the left or the right and make some small connection. Okay. If you take your hands off the wheel, it'll still stay straight for a while. But if it hits a little bump or something, you're going to crash off to one side of the road. So on the road, and you're not holding the steering wheel, and you hit a bump, and it crashes off the side of the road. You say, "Oh, what caused the crash?" Well, I hit the bump and the crashed off the side of the road. Yeah, but if you had your hands on the wheel and made some correction, you would have kept the car on the road. Okay, this, the car, the economy, has always got all these volatile pieces flying around inside of it. The steering wheel is the fiscal policy, these fiscal adjustments, with some minor fiscal adjustments. They might sound like a lot of money, but they're minor. You're just changing numbers up and down. You're not moving real goods and services. You don't need bulldozers or scotch tape or anything. You're just making debits and credits. You can keep the car. And when the government, when the government fails to do that time after time after time, we go through these horrible cycles of unemployment okay and uh you know collapse the economy so then they blame the fact that the road had some bumps in it well of course okay well, i go on about this forever so i'll let this go here so no, this the is problem good. is this is big time. so let's you yeah, so let's go let's talk about why trade deficit is not unsustainable and why it's sustainable okay or what makes it sustainable the only reason you can have a trade deficit, enjoy a trade deficit, benefit from it, all these imports, is because somebody else wants to sell you goods and services, take your money, and not spend it. Because if they spent it, they'd be buying our exports, and then we wouldn't have a trade deficit. Right? We'd be in balance. Here. So the only, and, and that would be worse for us, because then we'd have, we could import, but we'd have to give them all, and we'd have to work all day to provide all the exports, like they do. I mean, they work like crazy to provide us all those exports that we import. Okay, so the only way we can net import is if they decide to sell us the stuff and, and then just hold the dollars. And they hold them in savings accounts at the Federal Reserve Bank because they don't exist anywhere else, of course. But they, they, they want to hold the dollars. As long as they want to keep holding the dollars, we can keep running a trade deficit. And if they ever decide they don't want to, well, then we can't do it anymore. If they stop sending us free stuff, let's say, then we're going to have to make it ourselves. But there's no reason to kill the goose that's laying the golden eggs because someday it might change its mind. You know, if you got a goose laying golden eggs and you kill it, like, why'd you do that? Well, he may change his mind in five years. So now, is it probable that they will change their minds? Let's look at Japan. In 1945, World War II ended. General MacArthur went to Japan to arrange the surrender. And if he had said to the Japanese, look, you lost the war, and he could have said this, there's going to be war reparations. You're going to have to send us 2 million cars a year, or else we've got more atomic bombs. You don't want to be on the receiving end of that again. This is the terms we're going to demand. And everybody would have said, oh, you can't do that to those poor people. You're forcing them to sell you cars. That's what war reparations are. You know, not sell. Just give us the cars. Okay? That's what war reparations are. The car. They send you stuff. When you conquer somebody, you don't send them stuff for war reparations. They send you stuff. Okay, you know importance or benefit. Okay, otherwise it would be the other way around. When you conquered somebody, you'd send them stuff. But they send you stuff. Okay, and so we did. But what happened for the next sixty years or whatever it's been? Is that right? Seventy years now. Seventy-two yeah. years. 
91 years. Japan's been sending us 2 million cars a year. We've been sending them nothing. Okay? And they've been three generations living and dying, working at their machines, producing cars and golf clubs and everything else and sending it to us. And we're driving the cars and playing golf and we're not giving them anything. Okay? It's the biggest case of war reparations in the history of the world. <laughs> and they're doing it voluntarily because they have a surplus. They, they got $2 trillion or whatever in these these numbers in this savings account at the Federal Reserve, you know, we've got all this stuff and they think they're winning and we think we're losing. So we send trade negotiators to try and stop it. And the same with China, okay? They think they're winning, we think they're losing. You're sending us all this stuff, we give them a number on the scoreboard and congrats, you know, and get all upset because they're getting such a high number on the scoreboard and we will elect a president who's sworn to make sure this doesn't continue. It's like, what are we, out of our minds? This is complete madness. It, the standard of living right now is to is would be ending the trade deficit. You know, stop this nonsense. And so, uh, but you know, okay, deadly innocent fraud. What can I tell you? Well, that I got to tell you that right there. I mean, I always talk about sectoral balances and stuff like that. But that story about Japan—that's the first yeah. time I think I've ever heard that that way. And light bulbs are just going crazy in my mind right now. It's going to keep me up all night thinking about it. Because that is so amazing. And the scoreboard yeah. thing, which I use in conversations discussing other things, yeah. this just put it in like perfect, clear HD vision there, man. Thank you so much for that. Um, no, I mean, I, I win godly pretty well, you know, with sectoral balances and whatnot. And uh, I don't use that kind of language. I think it just obscures things. But for other people, it's helpful. So that's good. You know, I'm not against it. I just tend to not use it. Understood. And no, it, it was so clear. <laughs> yeah. it just it changed everything for me right there. So let, let's move on to this next one, which is number six. We need savings to provide the funds for investment. Yeah. You know, again, it's completely the opposite. Um, savings is the accounting record of investment. Savings is how we account for investment. When there's investment, we write it down as an asset, and then on the other side, it's called savings. Okay, and so as a, as an accounting entry, so it's a, it, savings for the accounting entry, and in the banking system, and so you have two kinds of savings and two kinds of investment. You have what they call real savings and real investment, which is real savings would be uh, capital goods, drill presses, buildings, things that you build now and you don't consume them now. You use them later. Or you use them over time. That, that's your savings. That's your capital stock. Those are your real assets. And then you have nominal savings, which are uh, entries on a spreadsheet, which we call dollars or money, or you just nominal savings. So they're, they're two different things. People confuse them all the time. And they'll talk about national savings, and, and everybody starts thinking, yeah, well, that's not what they're talking about at all. They're talking about debits and credits, a uh, fixed exchange rate system that we don't even have, another acronym. But so all, all I want to say is it, it, it's always getting confused. So let's let's sort it out. Savings we're familiar with, which is dollars in a bank account. The way you have dollars in your bank account is because somebody else borrowed those dollars and made a payment that wound up in your account. That's how they come about. Without that, those dollars are not in your savings account. They don't exist. So I was at a talk by Frank Kavanaugh, who had been chief economist for the U.S. Treasury for 30 years, and he wrote a book about why the deficit didn't matter or something like that. So the debt wasn't important. So I should have been a big supporter of Frank, and he was speaking at one university. But he made this statement, and he said, old people's savings is funding housing. Young people have a mortgage, old people have the savings. So if you look at a bank, you've got the old people with $200,000 in your savings account, and that money gets loaned to a young person who buys a house for $200,000. And I said, no, Frank, you've got it backwards. I said, the old person had a house. He wanted to sell it to the young person. The young person went to the bank and borrowed $200,000. The bank created it. You know, when the guy signed the loan document, that's an asset for the bank. The bank then credited his account for $200,000 in his account. Just changed the number from zero to $200,000 which he then used to buy the house, and he paid the old person. 200000 got transferred from the young guy's account that he borrowed to the old person's savings account. 
And so it's the young person's borrowing that funded the old person's savings. It's not the other way around. It's not that the savings funded the borrowing. The way it works in the real world and the banking system, the actual operational reality is that the borrowing funds the savings. Yeah, you know, I never thought about that. Okay, he's like 30, you know, chief economists. Never thought about it. Had it backwards the whole time. So we have the same thing about the other example I like to use is and this ties into our um, trade deficit and how they say the trade deficit is an imbalance when it's actually perfectly balanced at all times by definition. So you go to buy a car for $30,000. So what do you do? Let's say you want to buy a foreign car, a Toyota. So you go to Citibank and you arrange a loan for $30,000. Citibank lends you $30,000, gives you a check or puts it in your checking account. Then you transfer those $30,000 to the Toyota dealership and they give you the car. So you go to Citibank, they made a loan to you, you borrow $30,000, you pay Toyota, who then has the $30,000. Now the trade deficit has just gone up by $30,000. You just bought a foreign car, okay? Is it an imbalance? Who's in or out of balance? Well, you're happy. You've got a $30,000 loan and a $30,000 car you just bought, or else you went to buy it. You didn't like the deal. Why did you do it? So obviously, you're not like out of balance. Okay? Toyota sold the car and got the money. They'd rather have the money than the car. They wouldn't have done it. So they're happy. They're not out of balance. And Citibank made a loan in, you know, at 6% has a deposit at you know, 2%. They're making their spread. They're happy. Okay, so where's the imbalance? Right? And notice that it's domestic credit that funded foreign savings. Everybody says the foreigners are funding our trade deficit. It's the other way around. It's domestic credit that's funding the purchase for the trade deficit. So it's dollar credit that funds foreign savings. It's not like the foreigners started out with dollars. Where did they get it? They don't start out. They don't start out with any dollars. They sell the car. We borrow domestic credit, funds the purchase. Domestic credit goes up 30000 Foreign savings goes up 30000 Domestic credit, it's not the other way around. It's not that the savings funds the investment. Business, it's the same thing. If they want to borrow money to build plant or equipment, um, they don't. When they go out, they take out a loan, the loan creates a deposit, they then spend the money, that money winds up in the bank, it gets transferred from their account to somebody else's account. It's got the appearance afterwards that you have a loan in the deposit, the, the deposit you know, the money came from the deposits the other way around. The deposits always come from the loans. Any dollars you see out there uh, have to have to come from somewhere else. They start, the economy doesn't start full of dollars. Covered? What's that? It cut yeah, off so the anyways, way. so this fraud is deadly for a couple. <laughs> we got this misunderstanding of the trade deficit, right? The other is Congress believes that you need to have savings to fund investment. Oops, I think I just, are you still there? You just here. froze. Yeah, here. I'm here. Okay. Congress thinks that you need more savings to fund investment. So it gives, it, it creates all these tax advantage reasons for people not to spend their money and to save. Okay. And all that does is lower consumption. It doesn't fund investment. Okay, and when you lower consumption, and, it, and so now, and so I have to talk about that a little bit. It's called the paradox of thrift. Okay, why? Where does unemployment come from? What, what's it all about? Why does the economy slow down? And the way I like to say it is, it's always an unspent income storm. And the best place, the way to think about that is to think about what would happen if no one spent any of their income. What would happen to the economy? Well, sales would go to zero. The GDP would go to zero. No company would sell anything. They'd lay everybody off. There'd be no jobs and there'd be no income. You're, you're down to zero. Okay, so you have to have spending equal to income uh, to get the output sold. You know, if GDP is, I'll use a round number, 20 trillion, that means there's 20 trillion bought, 20 trillion sold, 20 trillion of expenditures. 
20 trillion of income. The income equals the expenditure at the macro level. In total, 20 trillion total income equals 20 trillion total expenditures. Well, not everybody who earned that 20 trillion spent all their income. And for everyone who spent less than their income, someone else must have spent more than their income, or you wouldn't have had 20 trillion spending. A simple identity. Right? And so anything Congress does to try and reduce spending requires somebody else to go into debt to make up for that, or else it's sold. The economy slows down. So by, by giving people tax advantage reasons to not spend their income, they're setting up a requirement for some other entity to spend more than its income. And it's got to be either the private sector, deficit spending, or the public sector, the government, but there's going to be more debt. So all the debt is created by somebody spending less than their income, someone else spending more than their income. And they're intending, because they think they need more savings, savings to have money for investment. They not to spend your income, it causes the economy to slow down. So investment actually gets lower because business doesn't invest because, you know, business always, investment always follows sales. sales so if you invest to service clients, if you have no sales, why would you ever invest? And so we've gotten into this spiral where we have all these tax incentives to not causing sales to slow, investment to, and investment to slow. So it's completely backfiring on Congress to have all these uh, tax advantages, to put money in IRAs, pension funds, insurance reserves, all these other things are causing investment to go down rather than up because they've got the savings and investment thing backwards. So that takes us, if I'm not mistaken, to the sixth penultimate deadly fraud, which is we need, uh, we just did that, didn't we? So we're at, we're at final number seven here, which is it's a bad thing. Higher deficits today mean higher taxes tomorrow. Right. And every congressman says that, you know, look, we can run a deficit now. We're gonna, that means implies higher taxes in the future. Well, once you realize that the, the purpose of taxation, okay, is to regulate aggregate demand, regulate how much money there is in the economy, not to get the money to spend. So when the economy slows down, you can lower taxes or increase public spending. You can increase the deficit. It's not a bad thing. We're not leaving debt to our children. It's just the dollars spent that haven't yet been used to pay taxes. It's the money supply. So what you're saying is, is if we run deficits today, going to need higher taxes tomorrow. Well, it's actually the only reason why would we ever raise taxes tomorrow? It wouldn't be to pay back debt or anything. There is no such thing. We've already talked about that. The only reason we would raise taxes tomorrow would be to slow down an economy that's overheating. You know, if there's too much money out there and it's causing inflation, then we might want to raise taxes to cool things down. So if high deficits today cause the economy to be too good, unemployment goes too low, goes down to two and a half percent, we're generating some kind of inflation. And so we have to raise taxes to slow it down because every you know we're getting the economy is too good. Well, that's a good thing, right? <laughs> that's not a disaster where everybody's working, there's no unemployment, we all have good jobs, but we're worried that this might get out of hand, so we're gonna slow it down a little bit. I don't know, that's that's a good thing. So if the high deficits today cause a situation it's going to require higher taxes. They're actually causing a good situation because the reason for the higher taxes would only be to slow down an extra good economy we think is too good, whatever that is. And I've never seen one. I've been around for 45 years. I've never <laughs> done life, and I've never seen this. But if it ever happened, I'd like to see it, actually, and say, okay, look, we're going to have to raise the taxes to cool it down. That means the previous program of running higher deficits succeeded, not failed. Now, of course, what they're thinking is we have to raise taxes and destroy the economy, create unemployment. Well, no, you never. That, that's there's no operational logic to doing that. That's just a deadly innocent fraud that we've already dismissed. Okay, so I think you got all out. Well, you've just taken us through all seven of the deadly innocent frauds. I appreciate you riding through all the technical challenges that this. I mean, let's be fair. Most people never get this opportunity. So I'll take the technical problems to get the information yeah. out there. And for me, okay. 
this opportunity to spend the time with you to hear this stuff, reinforcing, yeah. opening my eyes and helping people understand this stuff that much better just brings us that much closer to being able to educate one, each one, teach one and continue spreading us. Because right now, the things you said, I'm sure you could have taken us down a much more technical rabbit hole to uh, illuminate us with the orthodoxy of the day. However, when you yeah. keep it simple and these seven yeah. deadly innocent frauds are understood, our, our Congress, our president, our media can no longer lie to us anymore. Once our eyes are open, we cannot unsee this. And that's what passionately pushes me around the clock yeah. to talk about this stuff because my eyes have been open thanks to you, sir, and, and, and others within the Deficit Owl community. You guys have really, really done an incredible service. And I want to help make that thing just become mainstream. I'm, I want this to no longer be heterodox. I want this to become dox. I want this to be the, the only truth. And um, well, you know, my last my last paper that I did with uh, Professor uh, Salipo, we just got published in a mainstream journal first time. Really? Yeah. That's fantastic. I mean, yeah. seriously, I the thing that I love talking about you with you, Warren, is that the people in academia have to toe somewhat of a line. Obviously they are within a, a peer group of orthodoxy and to go too far heterodoxy, the way would probably put them out as a black sheep, but you just tell it straight. And, and I really, really appreciate, I mean, I, if you looked at some of the comments that were coming through here, many of them were saying, I love this guy. He says it in a way that I actually understand. Warren, that right there is worth its weight in gold. <laughs> Ron Paul would be so happy. <laughs> well, look, you've been very kind. Um, you've been with me for about an hour and a half now. Do you want to say any parting words before you go? Because I really appreciate it. Oh, I just, you know, I just really appreciate your efforts, and I'm totally uh, elated that you're doing this. And anything I can do to support, just let me know. I'm going to have you back as often as I can, and we're going to work through offline, see if we can find a way to get some of the technical problems worked out, because the words you're saying are really, really important. I mean, the people that come to Real Progressives, they don't come here just for head knowledge. These are people that take to the streets. They'll go to a congressman's office. They'll do an educational teach-in in Rand Paul's office. They'll go to the Capitol steps, and they will hold up signs, and they will make sure people know we're not messing around. So every word you're saying to them is giving them more and more incentive to take to the streets. And I'll tell That's you, right. as part of Real Progressives, I'm just going to put you on the spot here, not you particularly, but all of the owls. Randy Ray, if you hear these things, uh, Stephanie, Pavlina, all the gang, I want to have a march for economic justice, for macroeconomic reality on tax day. April 15th, either at the Treasury, at the IRS, at the Federal Reserve, at the Capitol steps, I don't care. One of those places, I'd love to have a march where we get a million people come down there and say, stop lying to us. That's what I really want to do. I think it's the only way to make people understand that we're done, that enough's enough. And um, I really thank you, Warren, for, for everything that you've done for me. If anybody out there is going to any of these senators' offices, like Grand Paul, you know, I'd be happy to go on. So, oh, well, just let Warren, we'll, we'll have to talk offline because I will absolutely love to do that. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, folks, thank you so much for coming here with Real Progressives yeah. tonight. Thank you, Warren. You are a, an amazing man, a gentleman, and a hero of mine. And for this day, it's a very special day, and I appreciate it. And I hope you'll come back again soon. Yeah, so I'm going to have to get a new hat because you got my head all swelled up, you know. That's all right. You're still, you're always humble, and that's what I love about you. Anyway, folks, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day, everybody. And.